Well, after that introduction, you are bound to be disappointed in anything I say for the balance of our time here together. Well, I'm very glad to see you all. I have no idea what you're expecting this early in the morning about the nature of creativity, but I'll try to avoid talking about that subject. Um, a little while ago, I was um, putting a show together for the um, AIGA, and uh, I wanted to put a show together that was not a collection of my greatest hits, but rather a work that I have been doing over the last five years. My assumption is that the, the other work that I've done has been seen frequently enough. And I began to put the show together, and I discovered something so interesting in the process of putting the show together, which was a series of hidden relationships between all the things that I had been doing. And I thought it would be more interesting to have a show that wasn't of um, the things that I thought were my best work, but rather a show that dealt with the, the nature of uh, continuity and change in our work as professionals. Of course, I've been around for so long that I have a lot of choices and to demonstrate that. But um, in my mind, I have two artistic heroes. One is Picasso, and the other is Giorgio Morandi, who I studied with in the 50s in Italy. And the interesting thing about them is they represent these extraordinary polarities. Picasso was a man who wanted everything, wanted all the fame, all the money, all the women. That was Picasso. And Morandi, on the other hand, was a man who wanted nothing. I mean, he just wanted to teach a little once a week in a very um, ordinary school in Bologna and then go home and paint. But uh, even in the work of these two, what uh, seem to be contradictory figures or polar opposite figures, what you discover, if you pay attention, is the extraordinary range and development in every case. In Picasso, it's very easy because his willingness to abandon what he already succeeded at is one of the sort of extraordinary things about him. Picasso would start doing something, would become brilliant at doing it, and then would forget about it and move on to something else. So he was willing to um, succeed and then abandon his success. And I always believe that um, one of the great difficulties of professional life is you can't fail often enough without being out of the profession, which is to say, in professional life, you have to succeed and go from one success to another in order to become visible and important. But in an artistic life, you have to fail over and over again in order to understand what you're doing. And in our profession, uh, a failure is not acceptable. And you might say, as a consequence of that, there really isn't enough development because you don't go beyond your sort of self-description about what it is you do and how you do it. But in the case of, uh, of Picasso, it is evident that his courageous uh, abandonment of his own accomplishment and history is one of the reasons he was able to move through the issue of style and manner into something else, that by failing, he learned. And there was a show of Morandi a couple of years ago at the uh, Metropolitan, I think it was about two years ago, where you really saw all these pictures, paintings and etchings that look almost identical. And then you discover that everyone is different, that in a certain way, the development then change is as profound as Picasso, except it is done in such a way that is virtually invisible. But if you walk through those galleries, as I did at the time, and even though I know Morandi's work, um, you are overwhelmed by the, by the different manifestations of these singular ideas about light and form. In any case, 
what I urge you to do is to fail more often in your professional life if you want to find out what it is that you're capable of learning. At any rate, uh, when I put this show together, I noticed these funny affinities and threads, and I thought it would be more interesting to explore those affinities than it is simply to show a series of singular works. So I'm going to show you what the show consisted of. And I wrote a little bit of, uh, about both the title and the meaning of parts of the show. I call the show In Search of the Miraculous, or One Thing Leads to Another. And uh, let me just read a little bit about the introduction. There was a, a uh, user's manual at the show, so that you actually had a text to follow the development of the ideas. It was a little more like a, uh, uh, a lesson than it was like a show. But in search of the miraculous, I remember reading Ospensky's book on Gurdjieff as a young man. I found it strangely unpleasant and unconvincing for reasons I don't understand. But the phrase, in search of the miraculous, has persisted in my memory. I love that phrase. One could easily say that all human experience is a miracle. Memory, color, taste, walking, skin, affection, vermeer, stars, watermelon, and so on. For those of us in and around the arts, the act of making things that move the mind is our deepest aspiration in regard to miracles, and that is truly miraculous. The idea of making something that moves minds is a profound miracle. And then one thing leads to another. I have two titles for this show. The second title evokes another idea, which is to contextualize the work in order to better understand them. This is usually done retrospectively after the artist's death, but that seemed, in this case, problematic. I've chosen work in this exhibition, largely produced over the last five years to demonstrate how one thing leads to another, it's fascinating to discover that something you thought was a brand new idea actually had its roots 35 years earlier. So this is the show. This was not part of the show. Oh, you know. I'm sorry. But this is not the show. Here's the show. Uh, this is a drawing of a guy um, named Rudy that I studied uh, kundalini yoga with back in the 70s. He was a remarkable guy, an extraordinary teacher, and he had an antique shop on the Lower East Side. But what I learned from him about was more about the relationship of art and energy than anything else. And, Sometimes later, I did this cover for a book. I love that title, Spiritual Cannibalism. <laughs> a lot of the work at that time got me interested in uh, Buddhist art and in tantric art and in general and Asian art in general. And some years later, I got the assignment of doing uh, the in, some of the interiors and artifacts and uh, identity for the Rubin Museum, which is on 17th Street. How many of you know the Rubin Museum? Well, that's not enough. It's, <laughs> it's a great museum, and they have wonderful events scheduled uh, that are entertainments. But besides that, it's a beautiful museum, and the collection is extraordinary. It'll give you a new idea of form, color, and alternatives to Western notions. This is the facade. It's a three-dimensional version of the uh, identity. And a study, uh, this was a, a study for a cloud wall. Uh, this is just a gilded paper that is uh, behind the entry desk. And one of the things that's also fascinating is the transition between sketches and preliminary drawings and finished works, and what occurs in the process of going from an idea to its realization. So this is the actual copper 
uh, uh, gilded steel, and it's uh, lit internally, which doesn't show very well here. But as a result of uh, starting this project with the uh, with the museum, I began doing a series of prints uh, based on tantric imagery. At the same time, I began to divide them into color studies of light and dark, because in most things uh, related to Buddhism and I suppose theology in general, the idea of light and dark is the core idea. So I began to do some prints that are based on what happens when everything uh, remains constant in terms of form and the color alone changes. And it led me to um, a series of uh, studies about pattern and color that uh, over the last five years have been very, very instructive. I mean, color is one of those subjects you never can fully learn. It's the most mysterious of all manifestations of the art. Oh, there's a rug uh, that was based on that print that's in my house. In fact, the rug that is below your feet is a rug I designed during that same period and then found it seemed to work quite well for the uh, theater. But here are just some studies that are generated based on forms that are repeated and then where the coloration itself creates a totally different meaning between the two things. And then there's this mystery of illusion. On the left-hand side, and you can actually see it on the right, there are these sort of six holes that appear. And those are just illusions. They're based only on the proximity of certain colors and shapes. But they don't exist except in your mind. And these were two mandalas that are being made into rugs. So these rugs are being actually made in Tibet and are supposed to be released after five years, <laughs> supposed to be released this spring. Here the exercise really was about this moire, which is that wavy illusion. It's most visible in the one on the right where the illusion of a kind of wavy form occurs only because the thin yellow line widens at certain points. And because of that, this illusion is created. The moire doesn't exist. It only exists in your mind. There's no physical reality. And I used the, opportunistically, that pattern as the background for a poster for the school, the School of Visual Arts, about the secret of art. I'm very interested in art secrets. And then another color exercise. This particular poster, which was used for the announcement of my show here, or at the school's gallery, is now hanging in my ophthalmologist's office. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I assume you can read it. It says, looking is not seeing. And then this whole idea of the idea of uh, that idea of creating light on a surface or the illusion of light. And I took this pattern that I had developed, which is simply a series of gradating dots, and we've all kind of worked and done something with this idea, and then used it uh, printed on. Uh, metal, 
as the basis for the bar that's in the lobby. This is a paper study. Again, it's so remarkable to see what happens between an idea in its early stages which leads you to something. And the clue here is really the highlight on the center of those curved forms and the bar itself where the, the metaphor of the light represented by dots and the reality of the light as it reflects off the surface is this incredible game that we all play between what is real and what exists only in the mind. Just another view. And the rug that uh, is now, to some extent, beneath your feet. Again, a study for the, uh, for the interior of the movie house. This was the earliest study I did. And all it was was a photograph of what happened when we tore out the inside and we saw that inclined plane of the roof and the character of the interior. And all I did was cut some pieces of paper out to represent something that might take place inside. And what is amazing to me is how close this blind uh, sketch, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing, actually turned out to be what the interior certainly feels like, but in a certain sense, really is. I mean, the idea that a few scraps of paper, gradated paper, and playing with that suddenly should lead you inevitably to the conclusion of what you're going to do, and that they would actually feel the same, is pretty amazing. On the outside, I did this study for the facade, and uh, we had planned at that time, and it's still being negotiated, to have a mural that runs the entire front of the building, and it is the secret of art. And there are quotes from everybody about what art is. And it's amazing what divergence there is on that subject, as you might suspect. And then an indication of this tower that now is uh, over the marquee. And this, again, was a sketch before we had anything. Uh, this is. Uh, uh, one of the great works of the 20th century, Tatlin's homage to the Third International. It was a, a model, it actually is about the same size as the, as the version of it that's on the marquee. It's about 15 or 16 feet tall. And it was only a proposal, and they were supposed to have rotating office buildings on the inside and the outside were ramps for automobiles so people could go up to the top story and so on. It is one of those things that has persisted in the history of the arts and in modernism forever. And I thought it would be very nice to do an homage to this reference for the school. And so here are the early sketches and studies for that. It's, again, it's so funny that that sketch on the right embodies everything that turned out to be both the object itself and its identity. That's, the identity. And this was a study uh, that Kevin O'Callaghan made, a rotating actual study of what happens on the uh, marquee of the building. And this is it under construction. And there it is mounted. And I, I, you may not know this, but it rotates on the hour at night every um, as I said, on the hour, and then there's a phrase having to do with the nature of time that appears. It's not the most useful clock in the world, but perhaps the most perverse. <laughs> and I think this moves. bad. <laughs> uh, 
another series of, uh, of identities for a theater where I did a, a Shakespeare portraits and identity for shows that were going on. I finally built up a, a, a big repertoire of portraits. The great thing about Shakespeare is nobody knows what he looked like, so the issue of likeness doesn't come into it. I've never been terribly good at likeness, but this avoids the problem. And this is for a, uh, the facade of a new theater that's being built in Brooklyn, which may or may not have a bunch of Shakespeare portraits as his interior. And this is a study for a Shakespeare Award. This is their version of the Oscar. And some of these Shakespeare portraits where I have actually combined the idea of Shakespeare with the idea of pattern making. Uh, I thought, since everything is connected, one of the great things about art is you can take any two things and make them into something that looks as though you intended to make it, and that seems to fit. I mean, rugs and Shakespeare do not immediately seem to be a logical combination, but they work out. And then back to this idea of light and dark. And here I did a series of, um, of prints and studies about, I call it stumbling in the dark. The prints continue the inquiry into the nature of perception. Does the difficulty in seeing these images because of their darkness and lack of contrast provoke the viewer to pay more attention, or does it produce indifference and irritation? The interval between looking and seeing is one of communication's most profound issues. Designers often comment that in the act of creating what turns out to be their best work, they often experience a sense of doubt and confusion. How could it be otherwise? Certainty is a closing of the mind. To create the new requires doubt. Or to quote old man Picasso, art is a lie that reveals the truth. So these are really an exploration in perception and what is understandable. They're actually even darker than they appear on the screen. in an early manifestation of my Shakespeare interest when I did this line of Shakespeare covers for Signet books many, many, many years ago. I think they still use them. And some early book jackets. You know, I'm sorry. This really is a separate presentation that has found its way onto this morning's presentation and doesn't really belong here. These are all about books and illustration and any number of other things quite under, unrelated to our thesis this morning. So I'm going to just forget about them. I want to see if I can find one other piece of the presentation, which meanwhile you'll get another kind of show entirely. <laughs> well, forget about all that. Um, the only piece that is um, missing here 
that has any relevance was a, a thing I did that was called The Client Didn't Get It. And it was a series of things um, that I couldn't get accepted. And what I said about it is every designer has a closet full of proposals that were rejected by clients. <clears throat> In many cases, they feel that these are their most insightful works. The reasons for rejection are varied and complex, but frequently these works represent the most transgressive and imaginative efforts. The professional requirement to, su to succeed demands that the work be mo both understandable and acceptable to its targeted audience. On the other hand, the imagination feeds on failure and ambiguity, which stimulate the designer's mind and potentially raise it to a new level of understanding. Failure and ambiguity are difficult ideas to sell to a client who simply wants to move more cans of tomatoes. Okay, we'll leave it at that and open the conversation a, a little bit for questions and answers. Okay, thank you. You, you mentioned that you like uh, art so, secrets. Could you get a little a little louder? I can't hear. All right. You mentioned that you like art secrets. Uh, that I like. You, art secrets? Secrets of art? That I like art secrets. Yes. Do you have yeah. a recent favorite yeah. that you can I like share? the idea of art secrets, yeah. yeah. So no specific secret whatsoever. No specific secret that you could share that you have found and liked? Any specific art secrets that you found? Any specific art secrets? Uh, art secrets. Um, I think I just misunderstood. There are no art secrets. <laughs> it's very Buddhist. Uh, Milton, I've known you for many, many years. I think you were a professor of mine when you were about 30 years old. Um, there's one thing I forgot to ask you then, and that was uh, when you do the pieces of artwork, and I know we're all interested in this, did you do every one of those by hand, or are you now have other means of producing those? Uh, every one of which things by uh, hand? Every, every piece of yours, is it hand-drawn and painted? Is paint your medium? Yeah. Everyone, everyone is hand drawn and painted. It's, that makes <laughs> that makes it even greater. Thank you. Well, as, as opposed to what you mean, generated by the computer from existing right, material. Yeah. No. Right. No, I don't. I don't do that. I, I design it on the computer, or to say, I have somebody working with me to put things together. For instance, on the patterns uh, uh, that I showed you, none of those are hand drawn. Right. All the pattern makings, but everything that's a drawing is hand drawn. And everything that looks like a painting is hand painted. Um, incidentally, I, I'm as those of you who know what I've said in the past. I'm, I'm a great believer in the um, old-fashioned way of learning how to draw before you do anything, for reasons that become obvious as uh, as you get older, which is to say that. The discipline of seeing something and representing it, which is to say, you look at something, you attempt through your eyes, it goes down your neurological path to your hand, and you attempt to represent it, is the way we learn about form. It's the way we learn about shape. It, it is not learning how to draw to become an illustrator. When I uh, entered the field, there was a contemptuous relationship between, and it perhaps still is, between people who drew and made pictures illustrators, and people who design things, were basically dealing with abstraction. Part of that represented the transition in modernism from the idea of storytelling to the idea of abstraction. And abstraction was, of course, intellectual and a much higher plane in theory. But as a result of that, the schools stopped, uh, as perhaps not that obviously, stopped teaching drawing. And it was an enormous loss to people who are entering the field, because where does your sense of form come from, except by observation and the attempt to replicate what you are looking at? So my idea of why you learn to draw is not to illustrate, but you learn to understand form, because later in life you discover that if you don't have the ability to create form, which is to draw shapes and forms that you can actually conceive and represent, then you have to find them. And that means that your basic methodology is more like collage than it is like making things. And I think that's, while you can do beautiful work, and many practitioners do, I think that ultimately that's a limitation. So my 
I have been insistent on the idea that learning to draw is the way you enter into design. After such a long career of so many successes, what are you most proud of? What? Um, what piece are you most proud of after so many successful um, creations and projects? Uh, I'm sorry, did you hear that? What, did what you are say? you most proud of? Yeah. Most proud of? Yeah, after so long career. Staying alive, good <laughs> God. <I'm there. laughs> I think if you're in the field, the thing that you hope for is that you'll be around for a while. And I perhaps overextended my stay a bit, but uh, the idea that I still go to work every day and produce work that I think uh, is of a good level and that I'm still active and still have the sense there's a lot to learn, that's what I'm most proud of. What do you do when the client doesn't get it? Uh, I think the thing that has served me most in that regard was when you can't convince a client that what you're doing is appropriate for their use, that what you try to do is not pander or accommodate as much as you try to raise the level, which is to say you try to do something better. And in almost all cases, you can. I mean, in almost all cases, you can find a better solution, a more articulate solution, a more powerful solution. So I think, professionally speaking, the most important thing for you is to understand that you don't, that the answer is not always going down and doing something less incisive or less valid or less, that if you can use that occasion to raise the ante, that's the best use of it. And that way you don't, you don't spend your life feeling compromised and feeling that you're never able to do the work that you're capable of. Again, so that doesn't always succeed. Uh, so. But in terms of a working method, it's much better than yielding and trying to accommodate before you try to raise the level. Hi, uh, you spoke quite a bit today about um, sort of failing forward and I was curious if you had ever in your career harbored any heartbreak from um, some of your failures and have we seen any of that work today and um, are there any projects that um, you felt that weren't accepted by a client that you still hold sort of dear to your heart and have special uh, have a special relationship with? Well I don't know how specific I, I have failed frequently and when I look back at some of my earlier work, I'm appalled at, uh, at things that I've done. Um, that's all I could do at the time. I mean, I, my expectation is always that uh, the possibility for going forward and for learning and for changing is the greatest possibility that the field offers us. And I talked a little bit uh, this morning about Picasso Morandi, but if you would say, what, are the, what is the great opportunity of work in general? Well, A, that you sustain your interest in it, because the most terrible thing that happens in work life in general, not only in the life of a designer, is you lose interest in, in what you're doing. And what happens to people in the design profession who lose interest is they plateau. They do everything within the context of what they already know, and they inevitably decline, and the work gets weaker and weaker and stupider and stupider. And finally, you find that the work no longer has any, um, any way of enlarging your life and you feel disappointed and bored by what you're doing, in that case, you might as well 
you know, be uh, a busboy in a restaurant. If you can't really sustain your interest in the work that you do, it's a terrible loss. Hey, Milton. Um, I noticed that you like to draw pictures of... I like to draw... That you like to draw pictures of places, people, and things. I like to draw pictures of people, places, and things. But you're way more articulate than I, and I'm not so. So does that somehow cheapen my artwork? Because I can't explain it. Does it do what? And because I can't articulate why I like to draw pictures of people, places, and things, and you can... Um, does that somehow cheapen um, my artwork because I can't explain on an intellectual level why I like to draw these things? Uh, what a funny question. <laughs> um, does it cheapen it? Um, the why in life is always invisible. It's hard enough to describe the what in life, right? The why is unavailable to us. We're too, it's too submerged, it's too contradictory, it's too undiscoverable. So I wouldn't, uh, being able to explain why you do anything is absurd, right? It's absurd, I mean, uh, totally. Why you had a fight with your wife that morning and try to explain it, it's absurd. Because it may have happened when you were two years old that set the stage for something that happened 40 years later, right? So all of that stuff uh, is nonsensical. And then the truth of the matter is that most of the experience of art is beneath our consciousness. We can only articulate the top surface of what it is we do by description. And that's enough, because the truth about art is that it is either experienced by the viewer without a narrative or else it doesn't exist. So you can invent a story that has no relation to the reality of the experience. In some cases, people will be satisfied by that story. But the idea of trying to explain what happens in the presence of art or doesn't is an absurdity. Well, thank you all very much.